John, a good guest uh, just before spring training begins and really anytime during the year, it's a place you gravitate to in the Met Clubhouse. It's uh, Brandon Nimmo. Yeah, really looking forward to this one. We, we, we absolutely love covering this guy. Just a terrific personality. I mean, he has adapted to New York from Wyoming like nobody's business. And it's going to be interesting to hear what he has to say about Alonzo, about the new team, the new manager and everything else. So uh, really looking forward to this one. Yeah, he certainly adapted better to New York than I would have to Wyoming. Uh, we'll talk to him about that adaptation and more. Uh, John and I will play winners and losers this offseason. We'll talk about the impact of Corbin Burns going to the Orioles. We'll play hit or error at the end if you stick with us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. John, it was a good week while we were gone for the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, they uh, have at least a preliminary sale to a bunch of uh, equity guys who have lots and lots of money who are getting 40% of the team uh, on the way to get 100% at some point, which should allow them to do more and more stuff financially over the next 5, 10 years when some of their young players are coming along. And look, we all knew it going into the offseason. The thing they needed the most was an ace. Uh and to me, Corbin Burns is the real ace because he is a real ace, not just because his stuff is great, and but he's durable. And like that's the – Garrett Cole's the best of it. I, if we were picking a second guy, could you do much better? Zach Wheeler or, Lo, uh, you know, uh, Logan Webb, uh, you know, those Strider. He's right in that group of who would you pick for two. So it's a great move for the Orioles to me. Yeah, I mean, that's the guy that they needed the most in terms of on the field. I and no question about it. I agree with you 100%. The thing they needed the most was a new owner. Uh, you know, sorry <laughs> to pick on the Angeloses, but I mean, it's been uh, it's amazing that they built such a good team uh, with that ownership and the lack of spending. Uh, and now they should have spending power and obviously a lot of room to work. I mean, their payroll is almost nothing. And it'd be nice to see them lock up uh, – Rutschman and Henderson and ultimately Holiday as well. And, and then now they have a chance. I mean, I think they talked to Rutschman a few years ago and offered him like nothing almost. You know, basically <laughs> there was not even a thought of it. So uh, it's good. They have a great they have a new owner. And obviously Burns, uh, that's the guy they needed. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if they are still working because they have such a great prospect stash. They could do another one if they wanted to. But right now with uh, Bradish and with uh, – Grayson Rodriguez, uh, you know, I think they have one of the best rotations in the game. Yeah, you know, John, one of the points that you've made pretty consistently, mm -hmm. uh, you know, especially in recent shows, is that the odds makers kept having, like, the Yankees bounce yeah. ahead of the Orioles, uh, and the Orioles maybe not have that good a se season. Um, I'm curious where it will be after Burns lands there, and I and just look. Burns going there is bad for everyone in the AL East and everyone in the AL because it so clearly what they needed to go with this, especially young, terrific group of position players. The one that sticks out for me for the Yankees is, am I thinking it because Mike Elias is there and Zig Megdal, are they about to become like the Astros 2-0, right? They're following that blueprint, which is they tanked for a while and they got great draft picks and they're able to get Rutschman with the 1-1. One, one. They're able to get Jackson Holiday with the with the 1. Mm -hmm. A great pick in the first pick of the second round on Gunnar Henderson. And then when it came time for the Justin Verlander move, the Garrett Cole move, they used their deep farm system, the Astros, to go get them in the way that they, you know, the, the Orioles just traded two pretty good prospects for Burns and all the prospect lists have come out like teams, franchises in the last week. And even with the trade, the people who do this work say the Orioles are still far and ahead of everyone else prospect wise. Yeah. I'm wondering, are we watching Astros 2-0? And is that a real nightmare for the Yankees? Yeah, very possible. And Michael Lance was with the Astros. He certainly knew the blueprint. Uh, he seems to be following it well. He seems to be a very patient guy. They, what, they lose 110 games three years in a row, something like that. I mean, they were a disaster. It was kind of like Houston. Uh, it is not a big market like Houston, so they don't have that advantage. But now they presumably will have an owner that will spend more. I can't imagine that he doesn't. I mean, it was day one that he uh, was the owner that they got burns. So they're already on, on the right track. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that is a huge move for Baltimore. I don't get why the Yankees have been favored. I don't know that that's going to change now, but 
As I said, I'm not a betting person, but I mean, you got a young team that uh, won 101 games versus an old team that won 82 games. And I, I agree, the Yankees were better than 82. They had a lot of injuries that presumably they won't be as bad next year with the injuries and they'll do better. And they got Soto, but I mean, Burns is a huge move. And uh, I mean, to me, stacking it up right now, I, to me, the Orioles are the clear favorite. I, I don't know what Las Vegas says. And, they should know more than I do, and I think they do generally. But uh, <laughs> to me, they're the favorite. Yeah, uh, and and look, John, I you, you know nypost.com. John writes for us all the time. Uh, he, you wrote about winners and lo- uh, winners uh, this right. week, and you once yeah, the burns <laughs> when, once the burns. You no, know, we'll do losers here because that's who we are. But. Uh, yeah. uh, you injected the Orioles once the Burns thing was made. So I know they're on your winner's list. And clearly, I think anybody who's looking at this offseason, as much as we always should look and say whoever wins the offseason doesn't typically win the regular season, it's hard to look at what the Dodgers did this <laughs> offseason and not pick them as the winner of winners since they ended up with both Otani and Yamamoto uh, plus Tyler Glass now. Uh, it just feels like who else could it be? Right. I mean, they spent over a billion dollars in Teoscar Hernandez and uh, Paxton. But I mean, obviously, getting Otani and Yamamoto, that's a billion right there. And, you know, they look like a great team, a super team, shall we say. I still think they'll probably sign Kershaw and maybe he'll be ready by the end of the year. They'll slow play Bueller. They're the clear winner. I mean, Orioles, I injected them. I redid the column to put them up there as a winner as well. I, I like what the small market Royals and uh, Reds did. I, I like the fact that they spent, even though they're not big revenue. So hats off to them. And, you know, I put the Yankees on the list because uh, of the Soto move. Obviously, that's going to help them. And uh, those are my winners. Now, the losers, they're pretty obvious, right? I think we can agree on the losers, right? Let's, the let's Red stick Sox. with the winners. We'll get to the okay, losers. Sorry. Let, wow, let, we're being very positive today. I like yeah, it. like uh, uh, I'm going to throw out a winner because I think it's an interesting psychological thing for the sport. The winners include people who've never played in the major leagues. Somehow, this becomes so much more attractive. You know, I understand there's no qualifying (laughs) offer on them. But Yamamoto, who probably will be very good, now has the largest contract in the history of the game. This will probably change with Bellinger and Snell and Montgomery. But Jung-Ho Lee right now at $113 is the fourth highest free agent signing this offseason. Yeah, Ariel Rodriguez from the Blue Jays, 32 million. Yuki Matsui, 28 million from the Padres. Man, do we love this uh, in a sport. <laughs> like, hey, we don't know their blemishes quite right. like we know everybody's here's blemishes. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you don't have to give up the draft choice, I guess, for them. But they, yeah. not only did they spend 325 million, which is a million more than was spent on Cole. Now, Cole is probably underpaid at this point, but. Uh, they have a $51 million, I believe, posting fee to pay on that. So yes, I mean, on it's top close of that. to $380 million. Then I add mean, that I, they're at the top of the luxury tax and they're going to have to pay right. that because they went over three, you know, 290. Right. What is it, 295? Uh, I think it's over the three, but yeah, it's in yeah. that range. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a little, it's unusual. I mean, uh, you know, everybody won Yamamoto. It's funny that Snell's out there. He's won two Cy Youngs. Uh, I get it. He's 31, right? And and uh, yeah, Mamoru's 25, and that is a huge factor in this. But guy has won two Cy Youngs, including last year, and had a 1-2 ERA from late May on. Uh, I mean, maybe it's the asking price. I don't know, but you know, we're not hearing of a lot of action uh, on a guy. And uh, you know, he was at your awards dinner. He seems like a decent guy. At least I I, I watched on TV. You were there. Uh, I watched it. He gave a nice speech. Uh, It's shocking to me that Blake Snell's out there and, uh, you know, he may get half as much uh, as Yamamoto when you when you count the posting fee. We don't know. We really don't know at this point what he's going to get. But I mean, it's it's stunning that uh, that these guys who have not played at all in the major leagues are doing the best. Yeah. Look, why don't we pivot to losers just because it's a place to jump off? He's going to get these guys a lot of money. Right. But right now, the Scott, the Scott Boris clients are kind of sitting out there. Spring training is about a week away from starting for everyone. It's probably a sign they might not get what they anticipated they were going to get when the offseason began. You know, just the, the finer points. Snell, Montgomery, 
uh, Chapman and Bellinger are the four biggest free agents left. They're all Scott's clients. And so they're kind of sitting out there right now as spring training goes. So I wonder if that falls into the loser's bucket. Well, we'll see when they sign in May. Um, you know, they obviously have patience, like the Orioles have patience. You know, we saw uh, Bryce Harper coming off of his worst season sign on February 28th, right? So you don't know. Uh, yes. And, and, and we know go. Scott pulls stuff right. at, at the end, right. like he's, you know, great at this. And and right. we're not going to have to send a you know a tin cup around for him. No, I mean know? we're yeah. going to have Nimmo on. He got Nimmo 162 million. I mean, does yeah. anyone think Bellinger could get less than Nimmo? I mean, we we love Nimmo. He's a terrific player. But Bellinger was an MVP. He was in the top ten of MVPs last year. Um, he's younger as a free agent, so uh, I I wouldn't worry about him if I'm Scott uh, Montgomery. He may just be waiting for Texas to resolve finally resolve the TV issue that may come February 9th, which is a couple of days from when we're doing this, February 5th. So I wouldn't worry about that one. The one that really puzzles me is Snell, though. Two-time Cy Young winner. You know, he's the only free agent uh, of this age with two Cy Youngs other than uh, Saberhagen and uh, Pedro, right? They, they, and that, they were actually 32, I believe. He's He's the youngest. So uh, that's the one that really shocks me. And, uh, you know, he may be concerned about that. I don't know what's going on there, but that one may be concerning. I, Bellinger, I, I have no feeling that he's not, he's not going to do well. Same with Montgomery. And, you know, I think Chapman's got teams. Certainly the Giants make sense for, for Chapman. And I think the Cubs make sense for everybody. Yeah, my, my idea was that for the losers, and I, I get it. At this point right now, these guys are still waiting out there without jobs. I would suggest the Cubs, Red Sox, who I give them credit for uh, bringing in Theo, not because he was on our show. And of course, we love everybody who's on the show, but Theo Epstein has won three World Series. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't give me the hand. We we do. Uh, so, you know, the Red Sox haven't done much in terms of players, uh, but that's a good move for, <clears throat> for them. Cubs, I thought they were going to do more once they brought in uh, Craig Council. They still may. Giants, I mean, to me, they're only a loser because the Dodgers have done so much great stuff. The Diamondbacks have done good stuff. Giants have done some good stuff, too. But, I mean, they're coming from a low point right now. They've had two disappointing seasons in a row. They obviously need to do more. I mean, I'm going to be surprised if they don't come up with one of these four guys. But uh, you never know. There are surprises in free agency. You never know. But like I said, I wouldn't be worried if I'm Bellinger or Montgomery. Snell, to me, is the, the really the curious one. Yeah, and look, if you think the late uh, uh, off season is the off late off season of Boris, wait till next off season. Assuming nobody signs before then, and Altuve might, but it's Altuve and Bregman from the Astros, and then maybe the three biggest guys in the market in Soto, Alonso, and uh, Corbin Burns, who we've already mentioned here, are all uh, Scott clients. On the subject, you already mentioned it of a Scott uh, client. Brandon Nimmo, uh, the outfielder of uh, the New York Mets, will be joining us next on the show. John and I are so happy to be joined by one of our favorites, uh, Brandon Nimmo. It's, you know, time flies. Brandon is already down in St. Lucie. It will be year nine Yep. As a New York Met, uh, year two on his eight-year contract with the Mets. And Brandon, I didn't introduce you as a left fielder or a center fielder. So why don't we start <laughs> there? Uh, you have obviously been the center fielder of the team. I don't love multi-part questions, but why don't I deal yeah. with what What have you been told by who that you're doing this year? And how amenable are you to wherever yeah. it is you're going to be playing? Yeah. So um, first of all, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, it's always good to talk with you and, and John. And, uh, um, you know, I think uh, to answer your question, what 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 was discussed in this offseason was um, David gave gave me a call early on, um, you know, introduced himself, said, you know, hey, I'm looking looking to make the team better. Um, and just kind of set out parameters of, hey, you know, I really believe in defense. And so, um, you know, he was just saying how he wanted to make the team better. So then he reached out to me a second time and said, you know, there are some pretty good defensive center fielders on the market. How would you feel about that if we pursued any of them? And so he, 
you know, approached me with it, uh, you know, very cordially and asked for my opinion on it. And I said, honestly, David, if it makes our team better, then I, I'm all for it. I, you know, I just want to, I want to be competitive. I want to make the playoffs and I want to have a chance to win the World Series. Um, that's my goals at this point in my career. And, you know, I would love to do anything that it takes in order to do that. So, um, you know, I said, you know, if, if you feel like, uh, doing, going in that direction would, would make us better then sure. But, um, I know that if somebody is coming in to play center field then they must be pretty dang good at center field. Um, and so, you know, then he kind of approached me, you know, um, I think it was, either late, late December, uh, somewhere in there. Um, it might've been, might've been mid December and, you know, it was like, Hey, you know, how, how do you feel about Harrison Bader? You know, we've kind of, we're kind of having talks with him. And, um, I said, you know, he's an amazing center fielder. Um, obviously, you know, the, the stats speak for themselves. Um, you know, and so, you know, what do you, what do you think? He's well, well, we want, we might have a shot at him. So, you know, so we'll see. So, um, yeah, then, then we ended up signing him and, and, you know, David just kind of called and he said, listen, you know, um, it's going to be totally up, up to you, whether you want to, you know, be able to go in both directions and play center field and left field. Um, or if you want to, you know, just stay in one position, we're fine with that too. So, um, I said, you know what, let's, let's go to spring training. Let's see how, how this all works out. Um, and you know, we'll start to get a better feel when we all start to play together and everything. And, uh, but I'm, I'm completely open to making the team better in whatever capacity that, at that is. So whether that's in center field for me or whether that's in left, um, is still to be, you know, to be seen. Um, but, uh, it's also going to come down to how Carlos, uh, and Mendoza wants to write the lineup each and every day. So, uh, I think having that versatility, um, you know, really can make us a better team. And I think that's what David was looking for. And he's really, really big on defense, uh, as well as he should be with, you know, with our park, um, our park plays more like a pitcher's park. And so, um, you know, we really need good defense out there. Um, and, you know, we need to be winning these one run ball games. Um, and, and a lot of times defense, you know, is what that comes down to. So, um, so yeah, I feel like, uh, David approached it, you know, from a, from a perception of, you know, I was willing to do whatever, uh, made the team better. And, uh, he felt like that, that is a, is a situation this off season that would make the, the team better. Um, and so that's kind of how we arrived at, at this position that we're at now. Brandon, I'm not surprised that you're flexible and all about winning, as we know that that's the way you are. So, yeah. and I know you handle uh, tough questions too. So I'm going to dive right in. Yeah. Uh, Pete Alonso. Uh, yeah. There's going to be a lot said about Pete Alonso and his contract situation this year. Yep. Uh, what are your thoughts on Pete as a player, as a clubhouse guy? I mean, that's only an issue because somebody brought it up last year, mm -hmm. I think. But I'll yep. let you speak to that. And uh, would you like to see him yeah. stay at Met? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I would love to see Pete stay as a Met. Um, you know, I think that he he's been nothing but, you know, positive impact on our clubhouse. Um, he's always fiery and ready to go. And uh, he always wants the best out of himself and everybody around him. And so, um, you know, I think he he is a is a great clubhouse guy. I think he is obviously, you know, one of the best power hitters in the game. And, uh, you know, I really think that uh, he wants to and, and should stay a New York Met. Um, ultimately, you know, that that will come down to what happens this season in this in this offseason um, and what is best for him and his family. Uh, I, I obviously, going through that situation for myself, um, you know, you have a lot of suitors and you got to decide what direction you want your life to go in. Um, and, and he will, he will as well. Um, uh, but, you know, obviously being selfish, I, I would love to have him. Um, uh, he's, he's always been such a presence in our lineup and always come up with big hits and, uh, been that clutch player and, um, someone that, that I think can turn our lineup around in, in an instant. Um, but, uh, you know, ultimately it's going to come down to, you know, where, where he wants to end up and where he wants to go, uh, with his family at the end of the, the year. But, um, I think that, you know, I think he does nothing but bring positivity and, and, and good things to the clubhouse. And then obviously we all know what he does on the field. So, um, you know, would love to see him staying in a Mets uniform. Uh, but ultimately, I think that that will be up to him. You know, Brandon, nothing quite aggravates me like a, quite like John getting to ask the tough question. So I guess I got to try to 
try to see if I could like one up it. it yeah. You know, uh, arguably your two best healthiest seasons were yeah. under Buck Showalter. Yeah. Uh, did Buck get a raw deal? Should he still be the manager of the Mets? See, see what I did yeah, there, John? That's great. See that? Yeah, yeah, great. Throw, yeah, keep throwing them at me. You know yeah. what? Um, I had a great relationship with Buck, and uh, I, I, I wish him nothing but the best. And you know, I enjoyed playing underneath him, as so many others have, I believe. Um, and you know, there's a reason that he's been in the game for as long as he has. Um, he really uh, treats his players well. Um, he does does so much on and off the field for them. Really prepared me in a way uh, that I uh, hadn't been prepared before on situations that might only come up, uh, you know, maybe maybe once, maybe never in a season, but maybe once every few years in in a season. Um, but for you to be prepared for those situations. And, uh, you know, I really I really enjoyed my relationship and my time with Buck. Uh, it's obviously not up to me on whether he gets to stay or, or, or not. Um, but I did enjoy my time underneath him. Uh, but I am I am looking forward to this new chapter. Um, obviously, we had a whole lot of new changes this uh, this offseason. And, uh, you know, it's down to the president of baseball ops and, and, you know, the new manager and, and uh, new so, somewhat new co coaching staff around us. Um, and then all the new players that we're going to have, there's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of newness this, this offset or this spring training. And so I am excited about that. That always brings change and, you know, change is different and hard sometimes, but, um, but it can also be really good. And so, um, you know, I will always say that I personally enjoyed, uh, my time with Buck and, you know, loved him as a manager and would have loved to have gotten him that world series. Um, but, uh, you know, and wishing him the best in, in his future, which I, I'm sure is not done. You know, uh, Mets management honestly telegraphed that they were going to try to compete this year, but really go for it the following year. So I mean, they made a lot of logical moves. I think they yeah. filled out the rotation uh, fairly well, considering those obje objectives. Yes. And, you know, obviously got bullpen pieces at the end, but, you know, you don't have the big names that you had last year. Right. Uh, Try to convince me that this team is going to contend this year because I think a lot of the fans are thinking it's going to take a step back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, understandably so. We we totally went with a different approach this year. Um, you know, obviously last year going out and, and getting Verlander. Um, you know, myself making making some big splashes. Um, you know, it's definitely a different approach. Um, it didn't work uh, last year, what, what we put together. Um, I'm not saying it's because of the signings. Um, I think it was more of, you know, we, we ran into a time where um, we just didn't, we didn't play that well, um, you know, and we kind of couldn't recover from that. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, going into this year, uh, they were circling of trying to, trying to be much more competitive, but in a, diff in a different manner. Um, you know, I know Steve is very much of the mindset of being adaptable. Um, and, you know, if you don't adapt, you die. Um, and so if you try it one way uh, and it doesn't work, that doesn't necessarily mean that you, you have to do it that way again. Um, and so I think he's he's willing to try a few different ways. And David um, had a different idea uh, going into this season of how we could compete. Uh, ultimately, I think it falls to um, if our guys can stay healthy um, and, and that that goes for the rest of the league as well. Um, if a few key players go down on, on some of these teams, it completely changes the outlook of, of your season. So um, first and foremost for us, I think just going into spring training, I'm going to be preaching that, you know, be taking care of your bodies and, and looking towards the long term, not just the short term. Um, because we're going to need everybody uh, pulling on one end of the rope in order to be successful. Um, but I think we made some great additions that uh, that can really help us out. Like I mentioned, we're we play in a pitcher's ballpark, and uh, and so it's more of uh, really trying to have, like David said, good defense and, and good pitching. And, and I think we made some additions where we're, we're deep in uh, deeper in in the starting staff, and we're also. Um, you know, have Senga coming off of a year where um, he got his feet wet and, uh, you know, I think he's really, really ready to step up as, as our ace. Um, and then uh, Quintana, when he was back and healthy, I mean, he really did do amazing. And I was so impressed by him and his work ethic and really just him, his ability to be a bulldog on the mound. So um, I'm excited for these other pieces that we've added in the starting rotation to learn from them um, and to learn what it takes to succeed in in New York and in the uh, in, in City Field in particular. 
Um, but, you know, I, I like these bullpen pieces that are added. I think depth is a really big, uh, important thing to to success for uh, for the season. And I think we've added that. Um, but by no means am I saying like, hey, we're, we're the favorites. You know, I think we're definitely going to be the underdogs, you know, in, in this season. But there's nothing wrong with that. I don't think uh, people are thinking much of us in 22 anyways either. And, you know, we ended up uh, having a pretty dang good season. So, um, you know, baseball is a funny game. It, uh, you know, you can you can think you know what's going to happen, uh, but that's why they play the game. And and that's why we play the season is uh, it really usually comes down to just a few games. And if those few games can turn our way um, rather than the other team's way this year, then we might find ourselves right sitting right in the playoffs and you never know what happens there. You know, uh, last two years, it's been wild card teams, you know, that have made it. And, uh, you know, just because you win your division or just because, you know, you have a great season doesn't mean you're going to have uh, a great time in the playoffs. So um, I think your, your goal is to get into the playoffs and then roll the dice from there. Brandon, you mentioned having some interactions with uh, David Stearns along the way this winter, especially about your role and the bringing in of Harrison Bader. I wonder, have you had interactions with Carlos Mendoza? And have you got an idea? You, you Look, again, you're not a newbie here. You're the senior guy on the team. Right. You know New York is a little different piece. Yeah. He worked in New York. He's a first-time manager. Yeah. You have a feel for him and how you think he might handle this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been able to have quite a few conversations with Carlos Uh and uh, we've started that relationship already. Um, yes, he he was in New York, and and he knows he knows what it's what it's about. It is going to be a different role in in the manager situation. Um, but uh, I think he's got what it takes. Um, he's been very calm, cool, and collected with me. Um, he's been very open to you know what what we want as players out of him, and and what he wants out of us. Um, you know, and I think that um, you know this is going to be a great. Uh, jumping off point for us for spring training to just see, you know, okay, let's get the interactions in and out, um, you know, start getting these new guys acclimated to, you know, how things are going to be run here and, and the differences in New York. Like you said, um, he's been there for a while and he can speak to it as well. And so can I. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, getting all that out of the way in spring training and then, you know, kind of giving us a good fresh start going forward for the season. Obviously, I'm not uh, I'm not a future teller. I can't you know, I can't predict it. But, um, you know, I, I think that he has the makings of a great manager. And, uh, you know, I know that David loved him through the interview process. And that's the reason that they, they chose him. And um, and so, you know, I think this is uh, this is going to be, you know, one of those things where we got to wait and see, you know, because I think, you know, on paper again, like I said earlier with the teams on paper, everything uh, looks good, makes sense. Um, but then we all have to go out and we all have to prove it during the year. Right. You know, I, I have to do that as well as Francisco and Pete. Um, and so he's going to do that as well. And I think he's ready for the challenge. And that's all you can ask. Um, and so, yeah, I'm excited about it. And I've loved the interactions that I've had with him so far. Um, but right. Only time will tell. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. You know, you're that rare player from, from Wyoming. I should have done some research. I don't know if there are any others or there might be one other or two others. I don't know. But, yeah, uh, you know, uh, how has New York been for you and how close did you come? I know we talked in spring training last year and I guess the Giants were pretty aggressive and yeah. they were talking to Aaron Judge at the same yep. time. Yep. So how close did you come to leaving and how has New York been for you? Because it, it has been difficult to to adapt for some of the guys who are not, you know, from a big city. Oh yeah. Uh, what do you do when you're in Manhattan? And yeah. do, you, do you live in Manhattan in the in the season? I know you're in Port St. Lucie right now and yeah. there a lot, but yeah. So we we lived in in Long Island City uh, for the the six years prior prior to free agency, and uh, you know it was just across the way from Manhattan, so I didn't have to like cross any bridges or tunnels in order to get to the field uh, because I did do that uh, when I first came up when I was staying over in a hotel over in Manhattan and. Couple of times there was like a little wreck, uh, you know, on one of them, and it, all of a sudden it takes an hour and a half to get to the field, you know. And I didn't, I didn't really like that. I like my routines, and uh, I, I like to be able to leave at a certain time each day. Um, and so, you know, I was like, you know what? Maybe if I just get on that other side, uh, it'll work out a little bit better. And it was. It was 20, 25 minutes to the field each day, and had parking on both sides and really had a great setup there. And we enjoyed our time and we were just one stop into Manhattan. So if we had an off day, we would go explore the food uh, over in Manhattan and go, you know, maybe enjoy a Broadway show. Um, we really tried to 
you know, when in Rome, uh, you know, enjoy New York. Uh, and, and we did, we have, uh, you know, I will say that uh, when I was, uh, you know, first coming up and even when my first experience with New York was Brooklyn in 2012, uh, it was a culture shock that there, there's no doubt about it. I will for sure say that, uh, you know, riding the, like I tried, I tried riding the subway a couple of times to the field and I was like, man, you know, this is, this is kind of crazy. Like I'm not used to any of this. And, you know, the, uh, just the, the immense amount of like concrete and buildings and it just felt overwhelming, you know, at times. And uh, I was so used to the big sky and open spaces, you know, and, um, and so I would definitely say that 2012, like, was a big point in my career because it gave me a little taste of what New York was going to be like uh, when I was hopefully going to come back later in my career. And it kind of helped me get some of the first time uh, things out of the way and some of the first time surprises. So it would definitely was a culture shock. But that way, when I came back in 2016, I was a little more prepared for it. Um, not to say that it wasn't different. There weren't growing pains along the way. Um, you know, I don't think I've, I've still ever gotten over New York traffic sometimes. Like, you know, it just... <laughs> It just is what it is. And, you know, it just takes time to get places. Um, but, you know, there's also been a ton of amazing things. The pe the people have been amazing to me. The fans have been amazing to me. Um, you know, really, they've enjoyed the way that I played and I played hard. And uh, no matter the outcome, they appreciated that I was giving it everything that I that I had. And I started to realize that you know, even though, you know, people say, oh, well, if you don't produce and all that, don't get me wrong. They definitely want you to produce, but they want you to give it everything that you've got. If you're going to be out there and if you're going to be playing and, and, you know, they're going to be coming and paying to watch you, they just want to see someone giving it everything that they've got. And uh, and I started to realize that quickly and it really rubbed off on me and gave me even more motivation to play hard and and to give it everything I had every day. And, and so I've really enjoyed my time in New York, but it, it is different. You have to be able to take criticism and you have to be able to own up to uh, to when you when you make a mistake, you need to be able to own up to it and say, you know what? Yep, I, I screwed up there. And if you do that, I mean, the fans of New York, they they embrace you, man. They'll get behind you um, and love you and support you. And so. I really think that I've, I've enjoyed my time here. Um, and that was part of the reason, part of the reason for coming back. Yes, it did get, um, we did talk with other teams and, and, and the giants were, were in on that, uh, among, among other teams, but, um, you know, ultimately it came down to at the end, um, you know, Steve, uh, and, and uh, Billy at the time, you know, made it very clear that they wanted, they wanted me to come back and, um, and they made the money figure right. And we made the years right. And, you know, it just made sense at that point that I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm really comfortable here. And there's, there's really no reason for, for me to leave. Um, and so, um, you know, it is, it is, a, there is a business side of things that, that comes out, you know, during free agency and, and all of that fit. And so then we came down to, you know, Hey, can we see ourselves staying in New York for the rest of our career? And, I really am comfortable here. I, you know, like I said, I live in St. Lucie. So during, you know, that's right where spring training is and then come right up to New York. And um, we've actually since made the move out to the island a little bit. So we're in like that Westbury new, uh, you know, uh, kind of area. And um, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's really just been a dream come true for me. Uh, being a kid from Wyoming that, uh, you know, grew up in a state of 500,000 people to go to New York City and be able to be there long term, you know, by the end of this 15 years uh, with with the New York team where there's, you know, there's 500,000 people on a block, you know, <laughs> let alone, you know, let alone in, in the whole state, you know. And so, uh, you know, I think it's just been a dream come true for me. And I've enjoyed every every minute of it. And, uh, you know, the thing that would really put the cherry on top of all of this is bringing a World Series to the Mets. So um, that's that's ultimately my goal. Um, I know that's the goal of Steve and the ownership and was a big reason for me coming back. Um, and I know that's the goal of David now coming into this pre president of, of baseball operations um, role. I, I know that he wants to win the World Series and, and build build a team to do that as well. Brandon, far for, be it for me to correct a guess, but not Brooklyn, God's country, number one. Uh, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> exactly. It's uh, but look, you mentioned how hard you play. And there, there was always that question of what about durability? Yes. Uh, which was an issue. And I yeah. looked it up. 
you've played 303 games the last two years. It's 29th in the majors. It's right behind Jeff McNeil is yeah. 20, 28th. Yeah. So how did you figure out how to play the way you play yeah. and play every day? Because you, 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 Alonzo, Lindor, McNeil are everyday guys in a sport where we don't see it as much anymore. Yes. Yeah. You know, it was actually um, this slogan that, that was said to me. It finally clicked with me um, in 2022. And it was... Um, you, you need to learn how to play smarter, not harder. Um, and and I, I was like, OK, you know, I didn't really get it at first. I was like, no, this is just this is who I am. This is how I play. Uh, but then, you know, I had um, a neck injury in, in 2019 that kept me out for uh, for three months. Um, and, you know, it came down to this play of I was in center field. I was playing a little more shallow. Um, because there's two strikes and Albies hit a hit a ball really well off of DeGrom. Um, and, you know, I went back and I kind of had this split decision in my head when I was getting near the warning track of do I just play this off the wall or do I do I go get it? Um, and I was right on right on the edge of it. And I just was like, nope, go, going to get it. And I did. And I ended up hitting one of those little squares that um, is for some reason not padded. Uh, and I ended up putting my neck underneath there and uh, getting a bulging disc and uh, I made the catch, but I ended up missing missing three months. And I, I kind of, I had Jay Bruce um, come over from, from the Cincinnati Reds and he complimented me on how I played and everything that I did. But he said, you know, the one thing I think you need to learn is is how to play smarter and not not harder. Um, he's like, nobody's gonna question how hard you're gonna go out and, and, do, and give it everything you have every day. But in order to play, you know, 150, 160 games uh, in a year, you need to learn when to when to pull the reins back a little bit and when, and when to let them go. Um, you know, and it didn't really click with me at first. Um, but after the, those injuries where I was like, you know what, uh, Jake DeGrom, you know, he's he's one of the best pitchers in, in the world. If you put, let that ball play off the wall, throw it in, you know, let him get the double. There's two outs. He's probably going to strike out the next guy and, <laughs> you know, and, and you're fine. And then guess what? You know, you're still playing for the three months and you're much more valuable on that everyday basis than that one play. And that's where I started to realize that one play isn't necessarily at more important than the whole season. That doesn't mean that, you know, like, hey, you know, like robbing that home run was really cool, you know, and uh, making those diving plays is, is awesome. And But just kind of picking your spots a little bit more um, and, and being able to be honest with yourself on, hey, you know what, my body's not that great today. It's, you know, maybe I'm playing at 70 percent. So I'm going to reel it back in a little bit, make sure we get through the day, do what I can today. And then, you know, maybe feel better tomorrow and be able to make that diving play or whatever it may be. But you're so much more valuable being there on an everyday basis, um, especially with what I believe I bring with my bat um, than, you know, sitting on the bench for three months. And so when it finally clicked with me, um, you know, Scott and, and I, Boris, we, we, we sat down and we had a conversation um, about, you know, about just that. And it was the second time that somebody was telling me, you know, like, hey, you're, you're really good at letting it go and going and playing really hard, but you, now you need to master the part where you're able to kind of like rein it in and pull it back and control yourself a little bit more. And, uh, and so really did that for the 2022 season. It worked. Um, and then it, it worked for the 23 season as well. And so we'll be trying to implement that same uh, thought process and, and, um, and getting ready during spring training in that way uh, as well. 22 also gave me this little, a uh, glimpse of what a shortened spring training would be like. And, uh, and, and I kind of started to, um, you know, adopt that as well. Cause in 22, we only have that three week uh, spring training. And I was like, you know what? I spend so much time on my feet during the, during the year and playing and, you know, this little short spring training might be beneficial for me. And it did turn out to be in 22. And then we mimicked it in 23 and, you know, we got similar results. So I think you'll see us mimic that again in 24. You know, Brandon, there's so much we want to ask and time is going to work against us. So let me let me wrap up by asking one that's kind of really timely right now. Yeah. Uh, I remember in spring training a few years ago, uh, you and I talking about Todd Helton. I actually called Todd Helton. Yes. I don't know if you remember that. I remember uh, and that. Got him yes. And got you two to kind of like talking to each other a little bit, I think, yes. uh, about it. He was your favorite player, obviously, Wyoming, Colorado. What does it mean to you that the guy you kind of grew up idolizing if yeah. I'm using the word right 
just yeah. got elected to the Hall of Fame. Yeah, for me, it's 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 amazing. You know, I think that uh, he had a knock against him playing in Coors Field for you know for his whole career. Um, and you know, I I get it. I get it. It's a it's a hitter's ballpark, but. Um, he just consistently put up numbers year after year, even playing in the 81 games that he would play on the road. It didn't matter. He was still a great hitter and such a presence in the lineup. I just go back to, I think, you know, and obviously I was biased growing up in that part of the country. But, you know, I remember watching Big Poppy and I remember watching the Yankees series and everything. But when we would consistently talk talk about, you know, who are the best left handed hitters in the game? You know, my dad and I, when we were trying to you know, trying to work on my swing when I was younger and, and who who we should try and mimic. You know, it was consistently Todd Helton that, that came up, you know, that was in the in that conversation. I'm not arguing that he was the best of that time. I'm just saying he's he's in that conversation of that era, you know, when I was growing up for for you know 10 years there where it was like, man, Todd Helton, he just puts up numbers each and every year and he playing, you know, almost every game and he's just like He's that guy that you can rely on and uh, you stick right in the middle of your lineup and, and you know that you're going to get uh, great numbers out of him. And so I, I am so exci- excited for him. I think, you know, obviously it's it's uh, uh, something that um, I think he deserves. Um, I think that he's deserved for, for a while now. Uh, and I did get to talk to him when, you know, when you guys got me in contact with him and um, he was just amazing to talk to. So uh, humble and any, everything and anything I asked him, I asked him about like how he hit left-handed pitching so well, what he did, you know, in order to uh, in order to do that, uh, you know, it, it, how he approached runners in scoring position, all these things. And and he was so open with me and and honest and um, such a great guy. And I was so fortunate to have that conversation. It really helped change my career. Um, and and so someone that has a special place in my heart that. I think, uh, you know, deserves to be in the hall. And I'm so glad that he got that nod. Well, Brandon, uh, we really do appreciate this. Uh, you know, we John and I are good reporters. We don't leave any loose loose threads here. Yeah. So uh, on the way out, you know, somebody on YouTube is going to notice that your dog has popped in a few times. What's your dog's oh, name? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got, yep, I've got two little ones, uh, Jake and JoJo. And, Jake uh, and JoJo. Both, both rescues. So uh, they'll pop, they pop in every now and again. <laughs> All right. Well, well, Brandon, uh, John and I look forward to seeing you in St. Lucie. Uh, thank you so much for the time. Uh, all the best health production. Uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. OK, yes, we'll see you soon. Thanks, thank you Brandon. guys for having me. John and I, of course, thank Brandon Nimmo for joining us on the show. John, our last before at least a couple of teams go to spring training hit or error. What do you got? I'm going to do a hit, and it's probably a little bit premature, but the Royals are trying to lock up Bobby Wood Jr., superstar shortstop. If they can do that, uh, kudos to them. I hear that they are making progress. If they don't get it done, uh, I'll be sure to give them an error next week to make up for this. But (laughs) for now, we give the Royals a hit. Yeah, I wonder if the framework looks something like Julio Rodriguez's deal that kind of has like that multi-tiered possibility of it, like lots of money both ways, you know, shorter and long term. I think so. But, you know, he does have two complete years and Julio did that uh, before he had one year complete. So that could change the equation to some degree. Yeah, it feels like the Royals want to put down some 10 poles. John, I'm just going to throw out a weird hit. I think it's a hit on... You know what's a good thing if you want to kind of make some money maybe in the marketplace is be touched by the Rays pitching group. Uh, They do have a lot of injuries, but man, do they fix people. Last year, Robert Stevenson went there. He had pitched for the Pirates to the point where he went there at a 5-1-4 ERA. He was arguably right there with Felix Batista and Devin Williams is the best relief pitcher in baseball from the moment they touched him there. And he got a three-year, $33 million contract. At the moment, Jake Diekman is released by the White Sox. He has a 794 ERA. He's 36 year old. old. He hadn't pitched well in the last two seasons. He went to the Rays and he his last 16 games, he didn't give up a run. He was really durable and good for them again. And he signed with the Mets, got four million with a chance to make four million more on a vesting option in 2025. And I guess we should throw in that Tyler Glass now got five years at a little over 136 million. He re- did reach 120 innings last year. By the way, that's his career high. And he still got this money. I think if you want to make money someplace along the way, stop by and you're a pitcher. You might want to stop by the Tampa Bay Rays. Yeah, I mean, Glass now, that to me is amazing. I mean, he obviously has number one stuff, but, uh, I mean, people are complaining about Snell's injuries uh, and, and innings. 
Uh, he's thrown 180 innings at least a couple times, 120 as your max. Uh, you know, I, the Dodgers do a great job, and they get bargains even on stars. They got a bargain on, to me, on Betts and on Freeman, but uh, to me, $136 million for Glass now, along with the Yamamoto deal uh, at $325 million, uh, that was pretty pricey. They obviously believe in those guys, and you're right, Tampa fixes guys. I guess that's what the Mets are trying to do with Fujinami, right? He's yeah. yeah, and you reminded me with the 790 ERA. Right? That's I think that's what he had last year. Uh, yeah, he with did better, a little yeah. better with the Orioles, though. Right? right with the right with Oakland, I think maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So maybe the Mets will become that fixer now. Everybody's trying to emulate the Rays. I know I'm here in Miami. They're obviously trying to be the right next Rays. Rays East. We'll see if they can do it. I mean. I get it. I mean, if you can win with a $70 million payroll consistently, uh, that's, that's a pretty good trick. Yeah, good trick. Uh, if you look, uh, we'll, we'll be talking about the Rays, the Marlins, obviously the Mets and Yankees. John, I think by the next time we speak, I'll be in Arizona. You'll probably be in Port St. Lucie. We'll be flip-flopping all spring training, talking about our travels. If you stick with the show, a podcast from the New York Post, we always thank our producers, Jake Brown and Andrew Hart. Don't forget Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to our podcast, um, uh, you know, apply, rate, review. Uh, it helps the show. Uh, we're also on the New York Post Sports uh, YouTube channel. Uh, give a look. You Probably if you have a good eye, you'll see uh, one of Brandon Nimmo's dogs sneak into the interview at the, at the beginning. And John... Uh, it's upon us. Now on when we're doing shows, there's going to be baseball players in uniform running around, at least in spring training. So stick with us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Hammond.